تو را از one of our partner uh, Jim is the is the tech uh, area lead for uh, autonomy at Aurora of Light Sciences, where he has been engaged in autonomy, flight control, and estimation research since 20, uh, 2006. He is one of the original team in Aurora, in Aurora's Cambridge office, which collaborate with MIT and other university on forward-looking uh, aerospace vehicles and concepts. Prior to 2006, Dr. Fadunoa was an aerospace professor, associate professor, and a principal research engineer at uh, uh, Aero Astro Department at MIT, where he received his uh, PhD in uh, 1991. Uh, we're gonna treat ourselves to a great uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, Jim, you can start. And also, Ali, are you there that you to announce for next week uh, presenter? Uh, yes. Uh, so I don't take so much time. We are all waiting for this uh, great talk for today. But at the same time, the talk for next week uh, is going to be uh, provided by, it's going to be covered by Dr. Abdullah Redwan Nawaz, is the postdoc in our research group. And his talk is going to be on anomaly detection for autonomous driving. Um, so I don't want to take more time on it, and uh, hopefully every can, everybody can attend and look forward to hearing today's great talk by Jim. Okay, Jim, it is all yours. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. I'm uh, excited to get this uh, program underway and get everybody sort of um, briefed on how NASA is thinking about the problem of urban air mobility. So I'm going to be talking entirely about urban air, mo air, air mobility as opposed to UA, uh, UAV um, uh, package delivery or uh, any other any other aspect of, of the AAM problem. Um, and and so just keep that in mind as I as I go here, and I'll talk about the difference between the different airspaces that are, that are involved. So um, this program is about doing research and development to create the next generation airspace environment, which is the urban air mobility environment. And uh, well, research and development is still required to determine how that these vehicles are gonna interact and remain safe and share airspace. But where do we start? The, the, the best place to start is by sort of laying down some ground rules for the environment in which the vehicles and the networks and so forth have to operate. So NASA is trying to play that role, bring together the community of interest and create a first cut representation of the environment and standards of operation for this 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 uh, this sort of new airspace environment. So they called the document that covers this CONOPS version 1.0 and CONOPS is a very common uh, name for the first thing you do when you're doing system engineering. So you start with the concept of operations, how things are going to work, um, what, how the how people are going to use it, how it's going to behave, and from that you derive your requirements for the various for the overall system and for all the subsystems that make up the system. So and then you refine those requirements, you derive requirements for subsystems, then you start doing your design. So there's a lot of work that has to go on upfront before you actually try to design things. And the CONOPS is the first step toward that process. So what so NASA's starting to do this. This CONOPS version 1.0 is it's a pretty uh, long document, it's about 31 pages, but it still has a lot of gaps because it's such a complex system and they leave a lot. They leave a lot up in the air. They leave a lot to be developed in the future. Um, but that's what we have right now. That's the first consensus we have about what the UAM system is going to be like. So th that's where the research and development should be performed in that context. So I'm going to try to distill down the 31 pages of this PDF down to um, to the about an hour that we have here. And I probably won't get through all the slides here. But I think of this as the movie that you make out of a book. I, I'm a firm believer in watching the movie before you read the book because 
once you read the book, the movie is a big disappointment. So those of you who have already read the comics version 1.0 will probably be very disappointed. But those of you that are hoping to read it, I hope we'll get uh, a good introduction, which will help you read in more detail and understand better what's what's buried in that document in all those pages of verbiage. So um, the document was actually attached to the email that you guys got for this meeting, but you can also find it on at the link that I've shown. I've also um, provided a link to um, the NASA working group um, AAM ecosystem site, which has uh, most of the meetings that they've conducted in the process of developing this ConOps, and they're going to have many more meetings where they try to get input from the um, all the people that are interested in making vehicles and, and being providers of services and try to build build on what I'm going to show you today to create um, the requirements that, that will be which will people will start actually designing devices against. So the way I'm going to organize this is to give you a description of the environments, which which I'll describe what UAM, UTM, and ATM are all about, how they overlap and how they interact. And then I'll talk about some of the overarching principles and the architecture that go along with the UAM architecture. And then uh, the different uh, players within that architecture, their roles and responsibilities, and some of those sort of details, we'll drill down in some of the details of the aerodromes, the corridors, and how separation works in, in the UAM. Um, so the first, one of the first uh, figures that you encounter when you look at this document is the one shown here. And uh, I started by making this slide that kind of breaks down all the details from this, uh, this figure. And I realized that there's so much information in this and it's kind of presented in such a kind of uh, hard to capture, hard to absorb way that I should try to break this, this figure down into, a, into more bite-sized chunks. So if we take this figure and we just start with the basic architecture of the of the UAM, of the airspace. So this includes both ATM, UAM, and UTM. So ATM is the air traffic management system. That's the existing system where fixed wing vehicles, helicopters, and in the future, these urban air transport vehicles, these passenger air vehicles are gonna reside. So when you see a blue bubble, that means that the air traffic management system or the air traffic controllers that we're all familiar with are in charge of the vehicle. At, and have authority over the vehicle and are, have some you know, responsibility for maintaining safety of those vehicles. Those are the blue bubbles. Uh, when they're orange, that means the urban, uh, sorry, the urban air mobility system, the new system that we're mostly talking about today is gonna be in charge. And then the green, green vehicles are, um, are the responsibility of the UAV traffic management, which is not a very good name, but it represents the the parcel delivery, the low uh, 55 pounds and other under vehicles that operate below 400 feet AGL. So what? So basically, the bubbles tell you what vehicles operate in each of these different environments. The color determines uh, who's in charge of those vehicles. So in the, with their orange, they're the responsibility of UAM, and if they're green, they're responsibility of the responsibility of the UTM network. And these are the and these two types of vehicles you see here are the new types of vehicles that will be flying around. You can see the, obviously that the UAM vehicles or the past passenger vehicles will be will spend time in all three of these spaces, and we'll talk about what happens when they're in each of those spaces. Um, so that gets you through most of the most of the sort of iconography that's in this little uh, key at the bottom. The UAM corridors are the are the portions of airspace which are like highways in the sky that um, in in which uh, the UAM primarily resides. Helicopters can also reside there, um, but fixed wing aircraft can, are not allowed to reside in that their airspace in in this configuration in this sort of conception of UAM. They are allowed to cross the um, the air the uh, UAM corridors. So this is a an additional little um, thing that's added to the key. C means crossing. So then they say they could cross here. It can cross here. It can cross. Well, actually, these are UTM vehicles that cross. So both UAM 
or sorry, fixed wing private pilot type vehicles can cross the UAM corridors, and so can uh, these small little parcel delivery vehicles. Um, they also talk about aerodromes, and they specifically mention that they are can be located in Class B airports. This is important because Class B airports are the B for busy airports, they're the busiest airports, and NASA recognizes that one of the main purposes of UAM is going to get be to get people to and from the, between major airports and the cities that they service. So they have to come up with a solution that includes op operation into aerodromes. And the way this is going to work is that these corridors are going to drill, essentially drill into the Class B airspace. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we go. And then finally, uh, you add all the other details that are in that slide, but when you actually look at each of those extra pieces that are that are shown in the figure, they're exactly the same as the one in the center. So all the all this extra detail, all it does is to is to, I guess, uh, uh, recognize that you're going to be in complex environments that have different levels of population and different sizes of buildings. Um, but other than that, these the operations are exactly the same across the different classes of airspace. So um, operation, and this is word for word out of the UAM, uh, the, the version 1.0 document, operations do not vary uh, with airspace class. You're in a corridor and you are, you're in this special space kind of all to itself and you can, and it doesn't matter which uh, airspace, uh, ATM airspace class you're in, unless you leave your corridor and then suddenly you have to play all play by all the rules associated with the class airspace that you're in, and you have to talk to a, the ATC and all of those things. The other thing to note here is that this here's a an ATM corridor drilling down into class B air sport, airspace into an aerodrome, but that's that's the only thing that's that you have to say about it. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as every other corridor to a landing site. So with that sort of breakdown of this figure, we can talk about some of the key things that are um, that are specified about um, the architecture of the airspace. So number one, all aircraft operate under UAM specific rules while they're in the corridors. So um, rules mean like rules of right of way, who you have to talk to, how, how you're scheduling yourself, procedures, um, and then performance requirements are um, how fast you need to be able to ascend and descend, how fast you need to be able to, to fly, to accelerate, and uh, what altitudes you're able to, to, um, to operate at and those kind of things. Um, so you can't be in the UAM airspace unless you meet certain performance requirements. Helicopters and UAM aircraft are allowed to operate in these corridors, but fixed wing aircraft are not. Fixed wing aircraft are only allowed to cross the UAM corridors, and that's because their performance characteristics are not consistent with the way that they're expecting these corridors to work. Um, once you're in the corridor, if you're allowed to be in the corridor, you meet the performance requirements. Operations do not vary as those corridors pass through different ATM airspaces. Um, ADSB, which is a, a radar system that reports your location and also receives locations of other aircraft, is a new, a relatively new way for everybody to be aware of everybody else that's in the airspace. Uh, NASA realizes that it's going to be swamped if everybody, if as the capacity of the UAM system starts to get much larger than anything that's currently in the airspace, ADSB will will be maybe overloaded, perhaps. And so they're they're specifying in this you know first cut that ADSB is not provided, is and is, you're not allowed to turn on your ADSB if you have an ADSB out while you're in the UAM corridors. Which is an interesting, I, I find, is a very interesting uh, way of looking at this, or way of way of specifying how things work. Similarly, and this makes more sense, there's no two-way voice clearances or authorizations from air traffic controllers. So even if you're in Class B airspace, even if your corridor is in, air, in Class B airspace, you do not talk to ATC, 
and they don't they don't talk to you they don't pay any attention to where you're going you have a separate mechanism for clearances and authorization which is going to come from the UAM system and not from ATC so this is to prevent overloading the uh, eight, the air traffic controllers with the dozens or hundreds or more of aircraft that are, are going to start to appear um, in the airspace. Outside the UAM corridors, if you were flying in the corridor and you suddenly left, then you would suddenly have to turn on your ADSB. You'd suddenly have to start communicating with uh, ATC and you, you, you'd have to um, apply to all the uh, ATM and UTM rules um, based on your, your operation type, your airspace class, and your altitude. So uh, this little blue bubble here represents a, a personal air vehicle and that's, that's left the corridor. So now it's basically under the ATM authority. And this means that these vehicles are going to have to be equipped uh, and certified uh, to fly in the national air, in the current airspace um, environment. So that's the architecture and and uh, kind of the sort of over, overall layout of how things uh, are envisioned to work. Uh, within that uh, within that architecture, there's um, there's these things called providers of services, and this is kind of a uh, sorry, providers of services for UAMs or PSUs. This is kind of a torturous name because they already used the name UAS service supplier when they built the UTM system and they're, they had to come up with a different acronym. So uh, if you're familiar with the UTM uh, system architecture, a lot of what's in the UAM is derived or sort of similar to what's in UTM. Um, and so they and, and so USS, uh, the USS is, uh, or sorry, the PSU is a, is analogous to the, the USS. Um, it, it's basically a centralized source, or it's a centralized repository of information to which everybody reports and from which everybody gets information. So it's, it's uh, you have to imagine that the UAM operators, which is actually my next bullet, are like, they're like airlines. They they own and operate a bunch of aircraft. <clears throat> they schedule they schedule their operations, and they you know <clears throat> they get they have different customers and so forth. But uh, they don't necessarily talk to each other. They talk among themselves, but they not but they need a mechanism to talk to each other, and that's what the the providers of services do. Um, uh, so basically. I think it's on the next slide. I'm going to skip to this slide. Um, if you look on the, the UAM network on the left, the provider of services gathers information from all the different UAM vehicles and I should and the UAM operators, which are down here, and then they re-disseminate it out to all the all the vehicles and all the other operators. So a specific UAM vehicle would report who they are, where they're where they are, where they're going, what their what is their intent, in other words. And they get back information about all the other aircraft in the area and anything that's happening that's sort of relevant to their flight. Um, this is, like I said, completely anal analogous. Sorry, this, this should say UTM here. Sort of on the fly editing. Um, completely analogous to the way the UTM network works, except as I said, they came up with a different acronym. This is U UTM service supplier, this is provider of service for UAM. But uh, so they they kind of have tested all the things out on the right. <coughs> they they spent a lot of time testing these out over the last three or four years, and they they've gotten some confidence, and they built the software that actually makes all this work. And so they want to they want to sort of take advantage of that. And so they a lot of what you see in the UAM ConOps version 1.0 it derives from what they learned. They also specify in the ConOps that these that these two um, providers of service will share information with one another. And then obviously they're sure gonna share this information with, um, with the air traffic controllers um, so that they can um, you know, be aware of what's happening in, in, the, air, in the UAM airspace. Um, the main sort of concept that they talk about in the, um, 
in the ConOps is this idea of sharing your intent. And what this essentially is, is flight plans, um, you know, what, the, what each vehicle is gonna do and when it's gonna do it. Um, so all of those flight plans are what I would call a 4D representation of your um, of the airspace you're going to be in, it's not only the the block of space you're going to take up, but it's that block of space changes as a function of time. So um, so you have to you have to publish what you're going to do, and then you have to conform to it. And and so that's the way that you maintain some sort of of uh, you you try to avoid chaos within the system. <laughs> so. Um, as the demand, the next the next thing they mention is as the demand capacity as the demand goes up for the use of the airspace, there needs to be some mechanism by which you balance that demand or share that demand among the different people that want to use the airspace, and they're giving a FAA the authority to um, to sort of do that balancing and and sort of decide how the space is going to be shared. Finally, they talk about this idea of aircraft automation level. This is a key concept uh, that um, is important for the UAM uh, evolution. Initially, the piloting control, the piloting command, who is responsible for the, the vehicle and its safety, will be in the vehicle. But eventually, that piloting command will evolve to be outside the vehicle. So what, um, what are his or her um, different modes of operation. If, they, if they're in the aircraft, they're always in direct control of the automation and the systems on board. And they're, they're always basically like a driver of a car, even if it's got an auto, even if it's using um, some sort of driver assist, they're, they're completely responsible for what happens with the, with the vehicle at any time. So that's being within the loop. Uh, being over the loop, would be more of a supervisory control where the system could go from point A to point B entirely on its own. And the only thing that you're doing is being very directly aware of every step of the process, very um, actively monitoring both your what the vehicle's doing and what the surroundings are doing and making decisions that could involve taking over at any time during, during the, the flight. And this might be the way that you would Think of uh, I think it's called a level four automation in in a in a um, in an automobile or the way that people seem to be driving their Teslas right now. You can you your hands are completely off, but you are you know in control at all times. Now over the loop goes one step beyond that, which is um, that uh, the pilots in the, the pilot's attention is not always on the vehicle and its environment. The pilot's attention may be on several vehicles and only becomes engaged when the automation system asks the pilot to be engaged or to take action. So this is a much higher level of autonomy and a much lower level of supervision by the pilots. And it's the only way that you can make the UAM system actually economically credible. If there needs to be a pilot for every vehicle, whether they're on the ground or in the vehicle, it's not economically feasible to carry people around, you know, at the at the price of an Uber in the air. So I, I made a, a sort of a bang box for this over here. The human passively monitors the system. They're informed by the automation if and what action is required and they're engaged by the automation for exceptions um, that are not reconcilable by the autonomy itself. So if everything's operating as, it, as you expect or completely nominally, the pilot is, um, the, the, the pilot in command could be in command of more than one vehicle and what that number can be uh, is yet to be seen, but that's that's the way they expect things to involve from pilot within to over to sorry from within to on to over the loop. So all of what I've just described is shown in this one figure, and of course there's more detail here than what I've described. It describes you know exactly what information goes between all the different uh, players, and um, it brings in. Uh, 
some players that we haven't really talked about too much, like the public and public safety organizations. But this is this should be sort of clear now that the within the context of this presentation, the UAM industry is really the main focus. The UTM industry has all of the same parts that you see in the green here, but they're not shown in this figure. Figure the only thing that's shown is the connection point between the UAM system and the UTM system, which is this UAS supplier of services. Likewise, the uh, air traffic management system, the current airspace, national airspace is not shown. It would be over here on the left and in orange. Only thing is shown is FAA, which is the main connection for the, they call it the air navigation service provider, some potentially special function of the FAA that's, that's, um, that's designed for um, interaction with, with, a, with um, the UAM. All right, so uh, some other key definitions, roles and responsibilities uh, are covered in the document. Um, the UAM corridor is one of the key things that's discussed fairly in, in a lot of detail, and I'll discuss that more in upcoming slides. It's a 3D route segment with performance requirements within it, within itself. Um, and those performance requirements, well, so the main purpose of a corridor, as opposed to anybody can go wherever they want to go, is a way to create tactical AT, uh, air traffic control separation services uh, without having to do anything. So you already know that those vehicles are going to be in those corridors, and if you don't go into those corridors, like except in off-nominal situations, and you won't hit any, it hit any UAM vehicles. So that's the main purpose. Um, but within, sorry, what, what, what's in blue here is that um, within those corridors, ATC also um, is allowed to um, assume that they don't need to provide separation or, or prevent vehicles from getting too close to each other within those corridors. So not only are all the aircraft they care about able to avoid the UAM vehicles, they don't have to worry about the UAM vehicles hitting each other. So um, what does ATC do or what are their responsibilities with, with respect to the corridors? They can, they're responsible for the overall safety of the airspace. So they're allowed to close down corridors if necessary. So they can, they can provide advisories. Um, they, they can respond to off nominal operations. Um, and so to, to do those things, they must have on, an on-demand access to all the information associated with how the UAM is operating. Um, and then they've also, there's also need to be some rules for how, um, how you cross corridors and uh, how you operate within those corridors. So those are all uh, detailed in the next few slides. Um, the UAM operational intent is, a, is the flight plan which has all the operation specific information. So when you, when, when you see operational intent, just think of it as a flight plan. This is the vehicle number, the operation, the ID for the particular vehicle, the tail number. Uh, this is the corridors I'm gonna fly in. This is my, here's where I'm gonna take off, here's where, here's where I'm gonna land. And anything that's gonna happen in between and the time at which it's gonna happen. So, um, so that's your flight plan. Uh, or otherwise known as your operational intent. The, op the operator, the UAM operator is like the airline. It's the owner and transport provider. They're responsible for developing a schedule. Could be an on-demand schedule. schedule. Um, they obtain uh, the conditions from this, um, this supplier of services. Um, there may be some supplementary data service providers. I didn't mention those. It's this like other information that might be useful about uh, micro weather, uh, aerodrome availability, um, things like that. Uh, so they, they get all this information, they come up with a plan for what their vehicle XYZ is gonna do. They provide that intent to the PSU, and then the PSU says, it basically uh, authorizes the flight plan. So, um, so they, they either say yay or nay to, to the plan. Um, the plan has to contain information about um, how you're going to deconflict, 
have sufficient information for the PSU to decide that you're not going to conflict with anything else that's happening. Um, the there's an information about the known airspace constraints and restrictions that you're going to have to deal with as you fly through the airspace. And um, you, you need to know, you need to sort of show that your um, your intent is consistent with all the advisories, weather, weather and so forth. Um, and all this goes, all, all this goes to de developing a cooperative separation management um, plan, a plan for separation with, from other vehicles that are within the UAM airspace. And then you also have to provide plans for what you're going to do if um, your engines fail or if you um, if you don't reach if if you have a uh, uh, an emergency en route or and basically this has to do with with the ATC's volumes through which you're going to fly and what what the airspace classes are. So can can you can you leave can you safely leave if you need to in an off nominal situation? Um, the UAS service provider. Um, is uh, sorry. Um, this is basically the one of the one of the um, agents within the UTM. So there's some inter interaction between UTM and UA and uh, UAM, and then ATC, as I said, sets the corridor avail availability. They don't govern what happens in the corridors, but they can shut one down if they want to. And they respond to off-nominal events. Main, those are their main roles. Um, so, so kind of the critical element of the whole system is the UAM provider of services. And so, as I said, the uh, as I went over in this previous slide, the UAM operator has to provide all this information about what it's going to do, um, what its intent is for each vehicle as it as it. Um, in real time, gets a new you know sets up a flight plan. Um, but what what the UAM provider of service has to do with that is um, analyze and confirm that the UAM operator's operational intent is complete. So they're the one that's they're basic, basically the authority that will accept the flight plan and say that it can be that it can be carried out without putting anybody at risk. So that's this number three is one of the key things that it does. They also provide a, com a comms bridge between it, all the different UAM actors. They um, provide information from, you know, they have, they're basically like a pool of information about everything that's going on. Um, and of course, the UAM operators use this to figure out, you know, where they can fly and where they can't fly and, you know, for the next flight that they want to try to carry out. Um, they provide the confirmed flight intent to the PSU network. So once once someone says what they're going to do, they tell everybody what that vehicle is going to do. Um, any additional notifications, like um, uh, airspace restrictions that have come down because of weather or because a ATC shut off a certain amount of airspace, these are in in the ATM world. They're called notices to airmen or NOTAMs. So the PSUs will be responsible for distributing those those things. Um, any operational data. Um, another big one is supporting cooperative separation management services, which is basically I'm going to talk more about separation, but it's basically what you do when things are starting to get too close together. So they want they need to be able to manage help help everybody manage separation. You know, keep things far enough apart that they're very unlikely to hit each other. And then there's some other sort of other status and, and operational data functionalities. Um, I just need to keep track of my time here. Uh, hold on a second. Got this little clock here. Um, okay, so so um, what when you're up and away and you're flying through these these. Um, these corridors, this, the PSUs are really the main focus of information flow and decision making. But when you're taking off and landing, obviously the aerodromes are where things really get tricky, and where um, 
honestly, there's not as much detail about how they're going to work within the ConOps. Uh, obviously, everything's sort of converging on these airports. They're very high density of traffic. So just like real current airports, they're a very complex part of the overall system. Um, so it's going to be one of the things that's going to require a lot of, of thought and uh, design work and simulation to actually understand how they're going to work. Um, but so, but it's not like I said, not covered too much in the conops. They say some fairly uh, straightforward things about about um, aerodromes. They provide they provide the resources for taking off and landing. They they tell people about the availability. Of, of their airspace, you know, how, how many people are trying to land in their airspace? Do they have capacity to take on another another flight? Um, things like that. But a lot of interesting technical questions are left unanswered by the um, by the conops. So uh, they didn't they don't talk at all about about who operates those aerodromes and what are their roles and how do how do different aerodromes interact with each other? Specifically, how uh, how are um, emergency landing sites uh, integrated with the existing aerodromes? In Aurora's models, we typically uh, design every aerodrome with uh, emergency landing pads within, you know, 500 meters or so of the of the main landing pad. Um, so then, another another big question is terminal area operations. We we look when we looked at it, we ended up using the standard patterns that are currently used by airports. And if, if you're familiar with those, they're kind of like a square pattern around the airport and there's different legs. You can join the legs in different locations, but you kind of merge with the pattern and then you follow the pattern in. Um, that's one way to do it. It's not necessarily the only way to do it and it's probably not the right way to do it for something like a rooftop that you see here. Um, ground operations and handling things on the ground is going to be a is a big question. We spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, where are the how the passengers handled? Uh, where are the bottlenecks? What happens when uh, things take longer than they're expected to take? Um, all the things that cause a lot of headaches in airports right now are going to be, in some sense, amplified. You know, because of the just the number of vehicles that are taking off and landing all the time. Uh, the comps do talk a lot about the UAM corridors. Uh, the picture on the right is basically a very good indication of how they think things will start. There will be a few places where you can pick up a vehicle and a few places where vehicles from that location will go. It'd be a very simple set of high traffic density start, stops and starts. It'll just be straight lines, very, very simple. But uh, if you talk if in some of the NASA sort of discussions, people have immediately said, we don't want to do it this way. <laughs> we want to go from anywhere to anywhere. And if you tell us we've got to do these corridors, we're going to end up using more energy than we want to. So for instance, if, 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 if you were a designer of these corridors, you might say, well, if I want to get from here to here, I would just go up to here and I'd turn left and I'd go over to here. Well, these things are very power limited. So people, they, the UAMs, the, the operators are not going to want to do that. They're going to want to go from here to here. So do we just create a, a fully connected network and have so many corridors that it becomes like a spider web? Uh, that some, some people say yes. They basically say, I want, I just want this thing to be completely free form. But, um, in the short term, when the capacity is low and there's only a few users, this probably is going to work fine the way it is. So, um, so I think it's a good way to start, and I think evolving from something where things are quite simple is probably a good way to do things. Um, so this is, again, no tactical separation by ATC. The corridors themselves are the primary separation mechanism uh, between, for, between the different um, traffic management uh, frameworks. And, and uh, within the UTM, uh, you, um, you have to have certain performance characteristics. You have to share your intent. You have to perform, you have to perform uh, 
communication intensive deconfliction is what I might call it. Not like ATC, where ATC sort of is a, tells every, everybody what to do. Um, and obviously supports a complete completion during off nominal operations. So um, I think I'd get into that a little bit more um, in the next slide. Yeah. So what what are these corridors? What happens within a corridor? And I think this is probably one of the another one of the very interesting research areas, uh, which is um, basically what do these how do these things operate once the capacity or the the number of vehicles that are operating within the corridor gets to an interesting level? And so they do have a figure that kind of uh, speaks to that. It's not not it's more or less like a highway in the sky and like a highway in the sky there might be lanes separated both by altitude and and uh, laterally that um, represent different types of actions that you might take um they don't go into too much detail about that in in the um in the con ops uh they seem to be a little more focused on this sort of legalistic question of demand and capacity balancing so um, once the when the once the demand exceeds the aerodrome or the uh, corridor capa capacity, the FAA gets to decide how to how to maintain equity, safety, and security. Um, they they do talk about adding additional tracks within the corridor, creating some kind of internal structural. They don't specify it in too much detail, or requiring. Um, certain maybe corridors to have increased performance requirements so passing lanes for instance um, there may be situations where you could reduce the separation minima so that you can get more capacity going um, or just have more corridors which obviously has its own issues um, but the separation both planned which is basically planning in advance you know what airspace you're going to reside in and during each each segment of time and um and and modifications to that as the flight evolves are the responsibility of the uam operator so i want to talk a little bit about strategic and tactical um separation because this is one of the most important aspects of air traffic management um strategic it means a strategy for the future uh a flight plan, which, if everything goes as expected, uh, would make everybody would maintain everybody far apart from each other and no no possible mechanism for them to ever interact or collide. Tactical, so that's a future plan or sort of uh, a plan for nominal operations. Tactical is more about dealing with the actual situation as it evolves. So, if you get behind your flight plan, then we got to make an adjustment. Everybody's going to have to adjust for that. So that requires shared awareness and procedural rules. They're going to be a big, a big part of how this works. So, um, so there's really three levels. This is the way the ATM works roughly, and this is the way I think this the system has to work. You have to, you have to have good mechanism for strategic, tactical, and collision type separation. So strategic is on the longest time scale. It's it's mostly about planning the future. It takes into account everybody else's schedule where they every what where everybody else plans to be in the future. But it's not gonna things are not gonna evolve in exactly the way that you schedule them. If there's uncertainty in departure times, winds, weather, um, deviations or or restrictions and imposed by ATC, um, events that happen that cause one vehicle or another to be um, operating off nominally. So you have to move from strategic plan to a tactical plan. So everybody knows where they're supposed to be. Now they're not quite where they're supposed to be. How do you adjust? So this tactical separation is keeping everybody well clear of each other, far apart from each other in the current situation, taking into account the perturbations that have occurred and uh, this requires deviating from the strategic plan to maintain separation. And ATC is responsible for that in the air, in the national airspace. Um, uh, but in this case, the UAMs are going to operate through the PSU to try to, to do that, um, 
to do that monitoring and replanning. So they don't talk very much about that, but that's a very interesting scheduling and uh, sort of autonomy problem that's out there to solve. Finally, collision avoidance is the shortest time scale when all else fails and uh, even you know your best efforts to tactically separate and to strategically separate fail, then you actually need to act to to make an, an evasive action or some course correction, which is just your responsibility. So you you don't tell anybody about it. You don't um, uh, do a lot of communication, except perhaps with the vehicle that you're about to um, you're about to come in close contact with. Um, you just solve the, solve the immediate problem. So that's that's what the and all, all vehicles that are currently flying in the airspace are required to do what's called see and avoid or do regard. You have to be always aware of all the airplane that, airplanes that are around you and take evasive action if necessary. So that's in the, it's in the way that ATC works and needs to be in the way that uh, these uh, un, unmanned vehicles work. But in the case of the unmanned vehicles or the passenger carrying fully autonomous air vehicles that all has to be autonomous. There is no time for a pilot to take action um, or the, the time, to maybe say it a different way, the, the time for pilot to take action is only sufficient if the pilot is on the loop and not over the loop. So as the pilots go to being over the loop, they will not have enough awareness of the airspace to make those short time scale decisions. So that's another very interesting problem. They're, they're dealing with that right now in the context of UAVs flying through the national airspace. So there's some interesting, uh, already some interesting research results and some interesting uh, work going on, both on the sensors and the algorithms. Um, the, the most, the most uh, fully evolved versions of these involve a pilot in control who's given a lot of information and then makes decisions. Um, those, are, those are slowly sort of getting more autonomous. But here you can see on the right, there's the same idea that ATC provides the tactical, sorry, the, the strategic and tactical functions, but at some point during the shorter time intervals, that has to be automated by a collision avoidance system. Remaining well clear um, is, is the goal if you can do it, and then at some point you have to do a much more aggressive uh, collision avoidance. The, the philosophy here is slightly different in terms of the responsibilities for tactical and, and strategic separation, but I don't want to get into details. So, as described in the CONOPS, the PIC operator is responsible, sorry, the, the piloting control is responsible for in-flight coordination to ensure tactical separation. So there, there is no ATC responsibility for creating deviations for tactical situations. That's the responsibility of either the pilot in control or the UAM operator for which he's flying. Um, the, 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 they need to maintain separation from other ops operations in the corridor, supported by the UAM itself, the service providers, and um, this concept of vehicle to vehicle um, communication, which is not mentioned in this context, but it is uh, briefly uh, alluded to in this picture here where there's V to V communications both uh, within a given operator's purview and across between uh, two different UAM operators. So the V to V con. Uh, uh, concept is one that people are very interested in, but was not covered in this um, in this conops. Um, now, if the, if the tactical action results in operation outside the bounds of the operational intent, then you start to get into more interesting situations. So, if if your tactical action makes it impossible for you to stay within your flight plan, then you need to do something that. It, has to propagate through the, net, the, the network. You have to tell them, I'm no, I'm no longer on my flight plan. Everybody's gonna have to, I'm, I'm filing a new flight plan 
everybody's going to have to now work within that new flight plan. And the PSU is going to have to accept that flight plan and things are going to have to adjust based on that. But what they're, they're, they're hoping that there will be enough um, capacity or sort of time available to, um, to allow that to happen. Uh, so I'm almost done here. The other defect tails that are, are briefly covered are listed here. I didn't think they were, they're just not quite as interesting to me. They're not, they're not covered in a ton of detail, but, um, but this is just the first salvo. NASA is planning to do integrated demonstrations that will have to cover all of these topics and the, the CONOPs themselves will become more, will become richer as time evolves. So all of these other aspects are going to be things that they're going to they're going to try to to cover and to to um to flesh out. Uh, I I think I want to leave room for questions, but I, I'll just mention briefly that they have at the end of the conops the non they they go through use cases. So as I described, both use cases and conops are the are the first stage of a system develop, system design process, and so they they. Um, did their diligence and did and created some some use cases and some off nominal cases. In the first off nominal case, um, you're able to file and you 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 go off your intent. Your flight flight plan is no longer valid. You you uh, propose a new flight plan and it gets accepted and it kind of fits within the current framework of what everybody's doing and you just you carry on. If and the second case is where you there's just no way for you to stay on your flight plan. In this case, it was a forced landing, and they basically revert back to the pilot in control being responsible for doing for the safety of the emergency situation. So this is not inconsistent with the idea of someone being over the loop, because what would happen is I'm responsible for 10 vehicles and somebody else is responsible for 10 vehicles. I need to deal with aviate, navigate, and communicate for this vehicle. I hand off all my other vehicles to, you know, six other people so that they they each have 12 or 13 instead of 10, and I deal with my one aircraft. So this could be done even in a multi-vehicle setting. But basically now you're leaving the corridor, you're communicating with ATC, you're going to your emergency landing site, which is hopefully automatically figured out by the aircraft, and and um, and you deal with it that way. So that's where I'll stop. Um, I know I've covered a lot of material in a short period of time, but if, uh, but I, and that, but I hope it sort of gives you a good introduction that you can can dive deeper and start to think about um, how how we can impact this uh, through this program. Great, thank you, Jim. Uh, really informative uh, talk. We really enjoyed it. Okay, question uh, from cyberspace. Jim. Well, I have a question, if I may. Sure. Um, Hussein Sarafzad, I'm the director of the Cybersecurity Center. I, I have no expertise in what you were explaining, Jim, but I could understand a lot of it. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my question is related to capacity balancing that you talked about. We do load balancing in cloud computing, and I was wondering if you had known capacity balancing models that we could learn from. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not familiar with those uh, capacity balancing rules, but there definitely a uh, lot of research went into capacity balancing for the airlines, and uh, this is a very this is a similar problem. It's not exactly the same, but um, the operations research uh, group at uh, MIT was directly um, interacting with the the airline experts in the aerospace department. So I, I think that there's been a lot of research in that area. But it, and there's a lot of cross cross pollination between different different or different uh, research areas that require demand balancing. Thank you. Very any other question from Jim? Uh, hello, Dr. Padono. I have a question. Uh, it's a nice presentation. Uh, in slide eight, uh, can you go back to your slide eight? Would you introduce yourself? 
Uh, I am Rinmo Sharkar. I am a fourth year PhD student here at uh, North Carolina a and State University, and I am working with uh, Dr. Homefer. Mm -hmm. So here in the first bullet, you mentioned about performance uh, requirement before you deploy the any aircraft in this uh, UAM system. So is there a specification or metric uh, how you uh, uh, test the performance of the aircraft? I, th I think that's still a work in progress. <laughs> We uh, the best I think the the best way to start to address that is through simulation, um, and that I don't know how much I can talk about it, but there but um, as I said, climb weight climb, climb rate is going to be very important. Climb and descent uh, um, flight path angles are going to be very important. <coughs> um, airspeed obviously and uh, acceleration. Uh, acceleration and deceleration at at um at the cruise altitude so uh, that, that um in the last meeting the cruise altitude was was mentioned as fifteen thousand feet it's actually something more like 1500 feet okay it's, a, it's essentially sea level cruise um performance okay uh, thank you sir hello, hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, Jim. Uh, is uh, did I take anybody's turn? No, it is your turn. Behind the screen. Okay. Hey, Jim. This is Yanis Raptis. We actually have met uh, many years ago, back in Cambridge. I have a couple of questions for you. It was a, it was a great talk, by the way. Uh, I was wondering. You talk about the air corridors, and uh, from what it appears the routes of the air corridors intersect is there any is there any guidelines for the what's going on in this intersection nodes well so the, the 2d picture so they have to intersect but uh realistically i'm imagining is that these things are these things would be stacked so they wouldn't, as, as long as you're going from point A to point B, and these guys are going from point C to point D, they would not interact at all. But you do want to have the potential to switch from one corridor to another. And there's no good example. Oh, well, maybe this is a good example. You're, you're, you would want enough corridors so that even if you're constrained to um, be in the corridors, your the penalty for switching corridors would be pretty small in this case. But you would so these two corridors would be separated vertically, and then you would have a mechanism to transition from one corridor to the other corridor. So you, you kind of have to imagine that the, each of the vehicles is up is taking a slug of the space, and that you're waiting for an opportunity to to inject yourself into an existing space, and that and that's the schedule that's the scheduling problem. And the, oh, sorry. That makes sense. Yeah, for the regarding the regarding the scheduling, uh, I think the terminology that has been used is the provider and supplier of uh, service. But yeah. If I understand, yeah. if I understand correctly, uh, when it comes to uh, you, just submit only a flight plan. The intention of going from A to B. There is no any other regulation going on three. Uh, after you go uh, in the air, in the vehicles, if I'm not mistaken, there is not like in air traffic management, there is some sort of real time uh, control. Everybody knows where everybody else is. But when it comes to uh, the UAM space, apart from a flight plan, then if I understand correctly, there is not any other control from the ground, right? Uh, traffic. So, so the idea here is a little bit like uh, free, uh, I think they called it free flight at the time, where the um, the, uh, the the UAM operator is responsible for in-flight coordination for tactical separation. So that so you start out with a schedule that is consistent, right? So there there are no conflicts in the schedule uh, associated with a given vehicle as it takes off, uh, given the state the current state of the airspace right 
So the airspace is up and running. Everybody's got a plan. They've all submitted their plans. You're going to inject yourself into that plan, and your plan has no conflicts. All right. So now you're halfway through your plan, and you are about to uh, say come out of the airspace that you had reserved. So you're you're sort of lagging behind the lagging behind in the slug of airspace that's that's moving along with you. That's your reserved airspace. And you're about to punch out of that space and and no longer no longer conform to your intent. So you report that, you report to that, you basically say, well, what can I do that will maintain separation? I can either choose another lane, like a slowdown lane. I can leave the corridor and wait for people to pass me. I can uh I'm not sure. I could land. I could land prematurely. I could land at some other location, or I could switch to a different um, corridor. So basically, you know, you can't do what you originally planned, which was, which was feasible. You come up with a new feasible plan. You submit that plan. That plan is now checked against the current system, which may have also changed. And then, if if it works, then you're good to go again. So it's basically plan and update. Is the way that they're they're envisioning this, and then if if that fails, then you have to move to an off nominal situation. So it's it's still nominal to replan. It's off nominal when no replan is feasible, and then you basically have to have to start to like talk to ATC and land at some emergency site or something like that. So. I mean, the idea is that those events are very rare, so you have to very carefully manage capacity so that there's enough uh, built-in separation for, for these off-nominal events. So, you know, what what is the capacity of, what will the capacity of the real system be is, is going to be a fairly complex um, sort of a Monte Carlo problem to solve. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Hello, Jim. Am I audible? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So my name is Avnizar, and I'm working with Dr. Maifar. I'm a second year PhD student. Uh, my question is actually on the localization of the vehicles part. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about uh, you know the traditional uh, ADSB technique is not provided in the UM uh, corridors, right? Right. So I mean, is it only on only for the UAM corridors or uh, it's on I mean for the entire uh, environment? Uh, they're talking about UAM corridors, and I think it's still I would say this is one of there's a couple things within the conops that I think are sort of still uh, I guess up for debate that people are still not sure they they're accepting. <laughs> this is one of them because uh, argument was that the that ADSB doesn't have enough capacity, but if you look at it, the a ADSB will have enough capacity for a very long time. <laughs> but they're they're trying to plan, I guess, for the the ultimate um, configuration, which would require um, the P essentially for the PSUs to provide the same service that ADSB provides. So um, some people have imagined. A network of um, stations say, throughout your city, which will not only provide you know radar information about all the vehicles, but also provide micro micro weather information. Uh, so different you know different bandwidths of radar, and then the PSUs would disseminate essentially the same kind of information that's in ADSB, but ADSB is a specific uh, is a is a specific specification a specific sort of um, uh, section of the spectrum and it's got specific it's got limitations because of that and they don't want to change it. so they're basically saying let's not use the ADSB does that answer your question yeah yeah sure yeah. Uh, I have also another question so in the document is there any uh, thing related to the mode of operations uh, like is it air taxi is it going to be air taxi or is it air pooling or metro so some of the things um, I, they're trying to be really fairly broad, uh, but I think they're mainly talking about air taxi in this document. 
they're they're certainly they're certainly not talking about um, cargo, and they're not talking about um, you know five pound delivery drones or drones that deliver five pounds of stuff. Those are those have to be the former has to be fly through the NAS, and the latter has to fly through UTM. You know, it has, it, they've got a, they've got a mechanism for that. You know, below 400 feet, and uh, there'll be there'll be some coordination, but it's it'll be a separate separate set of rules. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, Jim, I have a question. PSU is in charge of all the traffic for UAM. In my mind, the problem is going to come at the crossing. If different entities are not talking to each other, what is going to happen at the crossing? Well, like I said, the, the crossings will be, I think, will be separated vertically. So nominally, nothing will happen. Uh, it will get interest. It will get interesting when uh, people want to make turns at the crossing. And uh, I, I, I think it, it get the the number of pieces of information that are you're relying on from these PSUs starts to get pretty, pretty large. You know when you're letting people go, letting people jump between different corridors. So I think it does get. A lot more complicated, and that may not be realistic to ask the PSUs to do all that. But I, you know, you'd have to kind of, and 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 there are people that want to do this. Well, there's people that want to forget about corridors completely, and just uh, essentially do a, a vehicle to vehicle type negotiation to to make sure nobody hits anybody. Um, and then there's other people that want to use vehicle to vehicle. As one of the main mechanisms for deep confliction, like when you're cha changing lanes or uh, changing corridors. But I, I think it's all evolving. I think it's all up in the air. I think at this point. Then, is is vehicle to vehicle communication a realistic scenario? Is it based on some sort of a? Is it something doable for the for the? Uh, um, for the context of the air taxi that we have in mind right now. Like, for example, the infrastructure exists for ATM, but is a vehicle to vehicle communication something doable for uh, air taxis? I don't know. I mean, like I said, there's people that there's people that are big on DDV as, as a mechanism, as a as a safety mechanism, as a you know, a mechanism to to do something more like free flight and to, to I, I think it's a little bit more future. I, I would call it more futuristic, where, whereas what NASA is doing is is uh, it's more evolutionary. And so um, I, I, I feel like the main thing, I don't know this for a fact, but I feel like one of the things that they're, they are not confident enough in for V2V is that, that, you, can, that you can maintain connectivity. So, um, you can put a you can put a lot of of communication nodes on the ground to make sure that your PSUs are always in con contact with your vehicles in the sky, but a re somehow setting up the the RF uh, capabilities in such a way that you can guarantee that two vehicles will always that two vehicles that need to communicate will be able to communicate. I, I think maybe that's one of the things they're trying to avoid. Rely, you know, avoid relying on that. Can we build a network that doesn't rely on that? Thank you, Jim. Okay, one last question if anybody has. Uh, hello, Dr. Jim. Yes. Uh, uh, I am Rabbi, fourth year PhD student. Uh, I would like to ask you some question about uh, your uh, human collaboration or human interactions that you have discussed in slide 10. Okay. Uh, where I can see that uh, in your slides, you have uh, categorized uh, human with the loop, human on the loop, and human over the loop. Yes. Yeah. But I would like to know the, what will be the robot or the agent autonomy level? I mean, what will be the intelligence or the learning capability based upon which you have made uh, such a, a classification? That's my question. 
So you're asking how, how you will decide which of these you're using, or? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, more specifically, I would like to know that uh, what would be the agent intelligence level to classify each uh, uh, human with the loop or human oh. on the loop? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think it's I, I think it's kind of like these, uh, you know, the for for the um, self-driving cars, they they basically say, you know, it's level one, level two, level three, they're kind of fuzzy boundaries. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure they'll ever be able to make it, you know, a very hard boundary between, between these different levels. Um, but I, I think um, definitely, I would say that um, the boundary between within and on the loop probably be that, um, that within the within the, within the loop operation would be essentially uh, being having all of the having a level of awareness that's consistent with being in the aircraft. So if you're in the aircraft, you're within the loop because you're you you have all you have all of the sensory information and you can look around and you can and you're you're engaged. You're fully engaged and you're making decisions all the time. So as soon as you, so I would say that you you could set up that level of awareness on the ground, but as soon as you get on the ground and you start to uh, reduce the amount of of information that the pilot sees, then you're talking about on the loop. You're relying on the vehicle to have some of the awareness that you can't have because you're not in the that you're not in the vehicle. So that's kind of the dividing line there for over the loop versus on the loop. I think the dividing line is about two or maybe three vehicles if you're responsible for more than one vehicle then you have to be over the loop you the 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 responsibility for taking care of the vehicle is is the autonomy's responsibility the if you're familiar with you know you're you're familiar with human factors um, the pilot is is um doing management by ex management by exception so the vehicle does the vehicle flies the whole flight unless the pilot who's over the loop um, has some you know takes exception with that or or the autonomy itself takes it decides that it is not capable and engages the pilot to 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 um you know as an exception so that that becomes necessary when you're responsible for no, more than one vehicle you might be able to be on the loop for two vehicles maybe three but at that point, you have to be over the loop, and that so that's the dividing line. Okay, uh, thank you for your response. Uh... Okay, with, with that, Jim, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, and uh, really, it was a great uh, and very detailed uh, presentation. I yeah. to see you sometimes either here or yeah. in Boston. And if you have questions, don't uh, don't hesitate to um, to contact me. Oh, of course. Another thing that Jim, I just wanted to to let you know that uh, there is going to be a, a working group with industry. Uh, uh, Hanif is uh, uh, basically trying to put these things together. Sometimes in uh, Novemberish. Okay. So, uh, uh, Bruce was in the line also, so just I'm sure Mehran was on on the line, but Mehran was is he participated in a working group? Uh, okay. Board, but I just want to you to let you know. Okay. All right. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Have thank a good weekend. Bye bye now. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Mm -hmm.
Thank <laughs> you. 